I had the fortune to work with him for four years in Marie Curie project. Of course, being nephropathologist, uh, at the end of this presentation, I can discuss with a great emphasis with Harald about the use of renal biopsy. Thank you, Harald. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, yes, and I would like to give you an update and also to some degree a personal view on the state of the art in liquid kidney biopsy, where it stands right now, the advantages and, and, and also limitations. And maybe we can have a fruitful discussion at the end. Uh, I would like to start out with a few facts that we should keep in mind in my eyes. So the aim of the biopsy and also the liquid biopsy is really to inform about onset of disease, ideally early and precise, to guide treatment and predict drug response, and of course prognosis of future <coughs> development. Uh, it's not so much to know about disease pathophysiology because this may not really help the patient too much. And the concept of liquid biopsy is based on the key hypothesis that proteins are active and key players in every organism and drive normal and pathological processes. So in other words, they are responsible for any disease-specific process. And also, please keep in mind that proteins are the targets of every drug. So therefore, the analysis of the proteome, and especially of the urinary proteome, should enable the diagnosis, prognosis, and selection of appropriate therapeutic intervention in kidney disease, should enable the liquid biopsy. Uh, and we use the proteins, or our aim is to define the disease on a molecular level to, to enable diagnosis, to enable prognosis and prediction of response, to ideally also identify the potential therapeutic targets and to assess the efficacy and safety of a therapy in a non-invasive way. And Okay, last but not least, also to obtain knowledge on molecular pathophysiology. What we don't really need is to display the obvious. So there is no point, for example, in investigating the difference between very sick people and healthy persons, because we can easily assess that anyway. And based on quite a lot of data and rational, uh, a couple of years, the idea was born that proteomics can be a link to molecular pathophysiology. Uh, the, what I would call, old-fashioned way to investigate kidney disease is to perform a biopsy. Uh, maybe this works. Ah, this. Yeah. To perform a biopsy um, and then obtain information on morphological changes. Ideally, we may even see changes in the cell. But certainly, the drugs, as I said, act on, on specific proteins. They act on signaling molecules. And the biopsy will typically not inform us about the signaling molecules, about the nature of the signaling molecules. But clearly, the proteins, which are signaling molecules, or the knowledge about proteins should. So if we obtain the protein pattern of what is going on at a particular point in time, we should be able to detect the disease and also predict which drug would work best. And this would also enable precise and early detection. The status quo more or less is in the traditional approach is that once we have reached a stage where there is advanced organ damage, it will be diagnosed if possible. But the progress towards organ failure and death can be just be delayed. It, it cannot be stopped typically. While all these processes start at the molecular level. First, we have the molecular changes. And of course, here, this is where proteomics comes in. And we should be able to see these molecular changes in the kidney when we analyze the urine. Uh, urine has a couple of advantages. It's easily accessible. It can be obtained non-invasively in large quantities. Uh, from a technical point of view, the peptides and proteins in urine are very stable. Please consider that urine has been stored in the bladder for several hours before voiding. And this, of course, gives a big advantage of having stable <laughs> analytes. And last but not least, the urinary peptides, or the urine itself, should display the status of the kidney, but also uh, to some degree of systemic diseases. And this was known for a long, long time. Um, we have here the picture of, uh, from Gary Dow. It's called The Physician. Gary Dow was a painter of 17th century. 
And you see a physician looking at the urine flask. So it was always known there is information in urine. We can obtain uh, information about disease by looking at the urine, judging its color, uh, maybe its turbidity, by smelling it, by even tasting it. It's not very scientific, and I wouldn't want to do it. But nevertheless, it's clear the information is here. So the only thing we need to do is really uh, extract the information in an ideally scientific way, in, in a non bio uh, in an unbiased way as much as possible. And this can be done, as I want to show you a little bit later, by assessing the proteome. What we obviously need, since patients are quite different, is large database. We need plenty of proteome data from the urine, but also from the tissue to link the changes that we observe in urine with the tissue. We, of course, need the clinical and demographic data of the patient. We need sequence information to know which of these peaks corresponds to which peptide, but this enables us to perform statistics and identify biomarker that would enable liquid biopsy. Uh, the proof of principle that urine holds information about kidney disease has been shown quite some time ago. Uh, there was really a landmark paper by Good et al. in 2010 where they also showed if they compared the urinary proteome of patients with CKD with different etiologies, as shown here, uh, to controls, they could identify a whole lot of different uh, peptides, pe protein fragments, that are significantly different between patients with CKD and controls. It's not too surprising. Uh, one surprising outcome was that a lot of these, actually the majority of these, are collagen fragments, are collagen type 1 fragments, and they are reduced in kidney disease. At the time, uh, this was very hard uh, to present, but ultimately it got published. Uh, and it really changed the field, I think, or it is slowly changing the field. Combining all of these peptides, 273, into a classifier enabled very accurate assessment of kidney disease, as shown, for example, on this rock curve here. Uh, these biomarkers are linked at least to physiology. So basically all of these proteins can be found in the kidney. We find plenty of collagen alpha-1, for example, in the glomerulum. Uh, we find certainly lots of osteopontin in the kidney. We find plenty of the polymeric immunoglobulin <coughs> receptor and so on. So it's clear that there is at least a very good chance that all of these proteins and peptides that were described as biomarkers for CKD, for starters, may origin from the kidney. And the very positive part about it is they can be associated to pathophysiology. So here is the general scheme of pathophysiology, let's say, of chronic kidney disease, which starts with apoptosis and chronic inflammation. Uh, this will upregulate reactive oxygen radicals, advanced glycation end products will lead to inhibition of matrix metalloproteases, which in return will result in collagen accumulation, a reduction in collagen fragments. And this is more or less the first uh, sign, that the first indicator of kidney disease, it seems. If this process goes on, we will observe renal fibrosis, ultimately reduction in renal function, and a decrease in the GFR and an increase in plasma proteins. But we also have this, uh, what I would like to call inflammatory axis, uh, where we have acute phase response and upregulation of alpha-1 antitrypsin. Again, this is very prominent in the urinary proteome. The inhibition of plasmin, fibrinolysis, a downregulation of fibrinogen alpha, fibrin deposit, and of course, again, fibrosis, renal damage, and an increase in plasma proteins in the urine. So what I want to point out that the classical parameters like beta-2 microglobulin or albumin, but certainly also the decrease in EGFR, are not at all associated with the molecular pathophysiology. They are a consequence of the disease, but certainly not a cause. Um, based on these studies, CKD273, this classifier was used in multiple studies, and here is one, uh, here several of these studies are shown in patients with different stages of chronic kidney disease from early until very late stage, and typically showed an advantage uh, over the current state of the art. So there was clear that the peptides and proteins in urine are linked to pathophysiology, can inform about disease, and this has actually then 
uh, triggered the initiation of priority a randomized controlled trial where for the first time patients are stratified using proteomics, using, if you want to say so, the first uh, form of liquid biopsy. Normalbuminuric diabetic patients that have no sign of kidney disease uh, will be stratified according the, to the urinary proteome <coughs> in a group that is negative for the risk of developing diabetic kidney disease and a group that is positive. And those that are positive will be randomized to treatment, which is spironolactone on top of everything, or placebo. Uh, more than 2000, around 2,000 patients were recruited for the study, which is going on for five years now, and the outcome is expected by the end of this year. Uh, this has also led to investigate in more detail what do these urinary peptides and proteins tell us? How do they fit in disease pathophysiology and also in disease progression? And a very nice paper by Pontillo et al. 2007 showed that as expected, but still quite informative, there are changes depending on the, uh, uh, um, on the baseline. Patients that are at early stage CKD shown here and that will progress. Progression was defined uh, as a loss of 5% in each FR per year, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, patients that progress are defined mostly by biomarkers that indicate structural changes by collagen fragments. At a later point in time, we see more and more biomarkers, shown here in green, uh, that uh, indicate inflammatory processes. And then already starting here, but especially in the end, we see more and more biomarkers that basically indicate a functional loss, a loss of glomerular filtration barrier. So we see they, they do inform us about the disease stage as well. And all of this has uh, culminated then in the idea to use urinary proteomics as a liquid biopsy to perform non-invasive differential diagnosis of chronic kidney disease. To basically, instead of performing a kidney biopsy, enable to perform a liquid biopsy, to look at a urine sample and obtain the information on the disease etiology, and even more important, what to do about it, how to treat the patient. Uh, in order to perform the study, data sets were retrieved from this urinary proteome database altogether from more than a thousand patients, as you can see, with different disease etiologies. And they were combined in a discovery set of altogether 706 patients and a validation set of 474. And you can see the different disease etiologies here. And here we now see the results of the uh, validation in the independent blinded test set. Uh, the differential diagnosis was always based on one disease against all others. So this is the accuracy with which FSGS, based on the urinary proteome only, can be distinguished from all other chronic kidney diseases that were in the study. Uh, it, I have to admit it is not perfect, but uh, it informs very well about disease. And I would like to point out that in certain diseases, for example, IgA nephropathy, the treatment is the same as, in, to a large degree at least, as in diabetic nephropathy. So the question is, uh, maybe this overlap that we observe in these diseases is due to similar disease molecular pathophysiology and due to the requirement for a similar treatment anyway. Uh, when we look into, into these peptides or proteins that are changed in more detail, then this also may give us some hints on disease pathophysiology. I have to admit, this is in its early stages, the interpretation of the change of peptides in urine and linking these to, to what's going on this, in disease is a bit difficult. But some of it, of course, makes a lot of sense. Like, for example, we see an increase in hemoglobin fragments in IgA nephropathy, yes, of course, because we see uh, hematuria in these. The reduction in complement C3 is associated, in comparison to other CKDs, is associated with worse outcome. The same is true for apolipoprotein, and these were not patients that were doing so well. On the other hand, uh, 
we observe an increase, a relative increase in collagen fragments in lupus nephritis in comparison to other diseases like diabetic nephropathy or IgA nephropathy, which again makes a lot of sense because in, the, in, in lupus nephritis, the damage to the collagen, the cross-linking of the collagen, appears to be by far less based on other data. Um, in a study that was recently published by Pedro Magales and his colleagues, they could show a very, I find very nicely, a link of the urinary proteome, again expressed as CKD273, with the fibrosis in quite a number of kidney biopsies. There is also some link, as shown here, with the EGFR, but not that convincing, and certainly no significant link could be established uh, between the urinary fi between fibrosis and urinary albumin or uh, proteinuria. So this again indicates these peptides give us an opportunity to look inside the kidney without actually punching a hole in the kidney. And in <laughs> a further study uh, that was presented last year by Lindhardt et al., the authors could quite nicely show uh, that urinary peptides also inform about response, in this case, response to spironolactone. And those patients that had the highest scoring in CKD273 were also those that, that responded best. And we see also this here, where we show the relative reduction in urinary albumin uh, excretion, either in the placebo group in red or in the uh, uh, spironolactone group in green. And you again see the highest amount of reduction is in those patients that score highest for CKD273 in the urinary peptide scores. Uh, since there is some time left, I would like to present some other approaches that unfortunately uh, have not progressed so far yet. So there was quite a lot of hope associated with urinary vesicles, with exosomes or even microvesicles. They were first described by Pisit Kuhn and colleagues, it was a PNS paper in 2004, that showed that these vesicles that we observe as exosomes in urine are really actively secreted from the cells. So this is not a, a, a budding, uh, a stochastic process, it is really a controlled process, and in these exosomes information about the cells, obviously also about the kidney is contained. Uh, there was now a recent review in Nature Reviews in Nephrology, where again the authors uh, also nicely showed that we have on one hand the exosomes, then we have the microvesicles that really, so the exosomes come from the inside and they go inside out, the microvesicles that just <coughs> bud out, and then of course apoptotic bodies. And they once more uh, emphasized that there is a lot of hope with uh, the analysis of exosomes associated I hope that they may enable a, what you may want to call a liquid kidney biopsy. Uh, unfortunately, so far, the hope has not turned true. And not only proteins were observed in these exosomes, frequently also microRNAs were observed as exosomes, and microRNAs are certainly uh, a potential biomarker in CKD and may inform about CKD. Uh, I have to admit I have tried to present the case for the microRNAs, but ultimately I have failed. And one problem is that in all the papers, and I show you one after the other, uh, it seems that a different microRNA is presented each time. So it is still at the point in time, I would say, where the microRNAs are being investigated. There are good data that indicate an association of specific microRNAs with CKD, but it seems each study reports on a different microRNA and there is no consistency in this data yet. Uh, so when we compare now the liquid biopsy to the conventional biopsy, then there are advantages and disadvantages. Uh, let's start with the conventional biopsy, and certainly the advantage is it's based on the tissue it enables visualizing the insult in very great detail, provided a good pathologist uh, looks at it. It has a long history. It is included in guidelines and is quite a substantial nomenclature based on it. It is being used and it is certainly reliable. 
But there are quite a number of limitations. I think the most important limitation is it's an invasive procedure that certainly harms the patient. We just think that the benefit outweighs the harm. It cannot really be performed repeatedly, okay, maybe twice or three times, but certainly not every, let's say, two weeks. Uh, so it cannot be used to inform about uh, response to a therapy. It may not be representative. Uh, and on cases, it gives moderate guidance on therapy. And last but not least, it is, because it is an invasive procedure, applied at a late stage. A liquid biopsy, in contrast, is non-invasive. It can be performed repeatedly, and the sample is fairly representative. We don't have a sampling issue here. Uh, it can be applied at an early stage, and it has the proven potential to predict response, and it has actually been shown. There are certainly limitations. The biggest limitation, I would say, is it's novel. <clears throat> and it has not been tested in large clinical intervention trials yet. And another problem is that, of course, the liquid biopsy cannot cope with the unknown. The liquid biopsy defines the disease based uh, on information that is present. But any novel, any new disease uh, cannot be dealt with with the liquid biopsy, then it's of course, back to the conventional biopsy. But altogether, I think the major benefit of the liquid biopsy is it enables early detection of disease. And I took this from a recent paper from Sanchez Nino uh, that I think clearly shows the dilemma of the nephrologist. The patient should have come to see the nephrologist earlier. The patient should have been treated earlier. Uh, and I think this is what can be tackled with the liquid biopsy. Because it, it holds no risk. Patients will typically comply with it uh, while they may not agree to having a biopsy performed if they are at early stage of disease or they don't feel any pain. To sum up and conclude, um, liquid biopsy based on urinary proteome analysis has the potential to inform about molecular pathophysiology, to enable early detection prognosis, and it is expected to guide optimal therapeutic approach. It, basically empowers personalized medicine. And in fact, there are now efforts going on to initiate first clinical trials using liquid biopsy to enable personalized medicine in CKD, especially in IgA nephropathy. Uh, it is ready to be implemented. It is based on quite robust techniques. And the peptides that are used in a liquid biopsy allow assessing disease with quite high accuracy uh, and this is based on significant molecular changes that can be linked to pathophysiology. Uh, what I have not shown, but what I should point out, is there is quite a lot of variability in single biomarkers, as is in albuminuria. But this is really counteracted by a multi-marker classifier uh, that tolerates instability mm -hmm. and inconsistency of individual markers. There are other approaches, specifically based on endosomal vesicles or microRNAs. They do hold promise but I am afraid they're not there net, yet. They need to demonstrate value in at least some appropriate studies. Uh, personally, I would argue that liquid biopsy should be employed at an early stage disease to enable an early and timely initiation of the therapeutic approach. And the tissue biopsy, so the real biopsy, if you want to say, should only be applied if the liquid biopsy fails to give sufficient guidance for treatment. And I would like to thank all the people that have <coughs> contributed to the work, to the enormous amount of data that was necessary to establish something like a liquid biopsy. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Aral, for this uh, very exhaustive presentation that I know perfectly well and we discussed personally. Now I would like to have an interactive in my First question, my, my question, interacting with the audience. Uh, now, who believe that renal biopsy is now not useful? Who don't perform renal biopsy? Who still perform renal biopsy, please? Harald, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I'm very happy, no, I, I'm very happy because otherwise, being a nephropathologist, I lose my job. 
Paulus Kena. I believe that liquid biopsy is very interesting in following patients after kidney biopsy, but I mean, for example, after the kidney biopsy for diagnosis of primary and secondary glomerulonephritis. But in case of patients with diabetic nephropathy or patients with hypertension and kidney damage, I mean patients with secondary damage due to other causes, it is better to not perform kidney biopsy and to perform liquid biopsy and so to follow patients. But in, the, in case of patients with the primary and secondary glomerulonephritis, kidney biopsy is important because you can see if there are active lesions or chronic lesions and for, and for arriving to a final conclusion about therapy, yes or not. What is your opinion on that, Harald? Yeah, so in principle, I would agree with you, yes. Also, right now, we're not at the stage yet where the liquid biopsy can inform you about, for example, disease activity. I have hoped that this may change in the future, but as I said, in the future, so it's certainly not there yet. Uh, so I think ultimately, it's, it's up, of course, to the physician to, to make a decision, is a biopsy necessary or not? But as you also pointed out, in many cases, uh, the question of therapy can be answered with a liquid biopsy, and then there is not really a need for the risk of the biopsy. For example, liquid biopsy avoid the kidney biop uh, uh, routine kidney biopsy or sequential kidney biopsy in patients, uh, uh, in patients after therapy, because in this case you can follow the patient for looking at if, uh, if are responsive or not corticosteroid therapy or other drugs and so on. Liquid biopsy is excellent in this case. Yeah. yeah, and this is also where we want to go. So, for example, we plan on a study, if it gets funded, where we would like to guide intervention in IgA nephropathy with corticosteroid using liquid biopsy, because obviously yeah. the biopsy could not guide here. Other question? Maria. Thank you very much, Dr. Mishak, for the presentation. I would ask the question on the other hand. Activity, thank you, it's perfect. But then, once we have performed kidney biopsy and once we have established the diagnosis, would it be useful indeed to perform liquid biopsy, or what's your experience in this state, to prognose uh, the velocity of progression chronicity, like if we identify uh, collagen, types which you demonstrated, or uh, alpha muscle actin, or something like that. Could it be useful just right now? Yeah, uh, let's say it is, it is associated with progression. In other words, it allows you to predict <coughs> progression, of course, always with a certain window. And certain biomarkers are associated with response to certain drugs. Yeah. Uh, so this is the information it can give you right now already. Uh, it, it then really depends on, on, on your specific question. Yeah, because I performed it being a renal pathologist. In pathology, we performed immunostaining. And so in, instead of repeating the biopsy in years, could we, once diagnosis established, use the liquid biopsy to estimate the progression? Yes. Needs? These implants, yes. Could be, could be, like deposition of collagen and... Yeah. Basically, Let's this say, is what we're doing with the diabetic patients already anyway. And uh, what's your experience in IgA nephropathy? Um, it, so far, we have not applied it in IgA nephropathy as a, in a prospective study. Uh, IgA nephropathy can be detected. It seems it can be separated in probably even three different groups based on the molecular signature. And there are some, now yeah, Let's say there is some hope that one of these groups seem to be associated with the response to corticosteroids, but this is not very hard evidence yet. So this is what we want to investigate in a, investigate. In a prospective trial. Me too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, we have no time to other questions. And uh, I invite uh, Dr. Alejandro Chad.